the Council Committee on Outreach Communications and Appointments. It is January 6, 2020, and I am calling our meeting to order at 9.34 a.m. Uh, we have what could turn out to be a fairly ambitious agenda today, um, but I think that we can get through it, uh, hopefully within the two hours we've allotted. Um, so you have a packet that has several documents in it. My apologies that some of them weren't uploaded until uh, yesterday evening, uh, but they are all there, um, and I will get that on the town website uh, once I can. The first agenda item, however, um, is discussion of the GOL proposal regarding OCA. So this was originally on our agenda for our December 20th meeting. Um, and you know, at that point, GOL had uh, somewhat decided on the direction uh, of which way that that committee was going to be going uh, to propose a committee restructuring for the town council um, per its charge uh, to evaluate st town council standing committees. Um, so GOL sort of made that decision uh, the Wednesday before um, and then we met on the 20th, uh, and that was on our agenda. Unfortunately, um, Sarah wasn't able to attend that meeting, and Darcy had to leave that meeting early, and so wasn't around for that discussion. And so the discussion uh, did occur, but it took place only between uh, George, Alyssa, and myself. Uh, George and myself, of course, are on GOL, so it was really just a conversation with Alyssa. Um, and so because of that, and because I want to make sure that OCA has discussed what GOL is proposing um, and has a response at tonight's council meeting, uh, I put it on our agenda again um, so that we could have all members of OCA weigh in. Um, the benefit of having this on the agenda again is we actually had the GOL proposal. Um, and so that is in your packet, so hopefully you got a chance to look through that. Um, and so what I'm going to be, so basically the proposal um, involves uh, the dissolution of OCA, reallocating appointments to the Governance Organization and Legislation Committee, and then um, creating a new committee that takes OCA's outreach component and merges it with some elements of the current uh, CRC charge. Uh, so I'm going to step back and just ask for input from the full committee, but especially from Sarah and Darcy since they were not present for uh, that first conversation. Uh, uh, I wouldn't dare ever tell you not to. <laughs> yes, so, so I know that last time my computer was, was very unhappy, and so that was extremely distracting for me, but I would love to be reminded of whatever it was I said at that conversation last time because I don't really remember it and I do remember being frustrated as I just mentioned um, offline here that GOL, while yes, this is in their charge, I would have thought talking to the committees before putting something out to council would have been the logical approach. I thought it was interesting that it wasn't done that way, and I would think that people would think, for example, that with OCA, that since we have two members of OCA on GOL, that people would assume that OCA had talked about it before it got floated, and so that didn't happen, and so that was just a different approach, and so I was just, a, I actually was just surprised by the whole thing, because I didn't know it was actually going to happen, and then it didn't happen here. So if I said anything useful last time, I'd love to remember that, but I don't remember the conversation, so I'll just let other people so talk. I was going to address those two things. Oh, technical. Is that my computer seems to be loaded? I've never seen it. I have no share points. So I just need to see it. I don't know why. But it's never There's just no share point? No. I mean, I hit the thing and it's blah, 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 but there's no share point. So that's never happened. Okay. And you do not take any share points. So Athena, we'll look at it. Maybe we'll, we, if we have to, we can call Sean. Yeah. Um, uh, let me address. Uh, Alyssa's two points, uh, reminding you what you said. Um, so, <laughs> so uh, always, my recollection, um, and I, I don't have the minutes directly in front of me, but my recollection of that um, 
was basically one um, that you uh, said that you felt as though you disagreed with some of the ways that CRC was divided up, um, but didn't necessarily articulate why. But the, the main, and we didn't spend a, a, a huge amount of time on this because it was at the end of what was already a very long movie, movie meeting. Um, one of the things that you were concerned about that we spent most of our time talking about was sort of the logistical considerations of restructuring while we're in the middle of executing a process we just adopted to appoint members of the planning board. Um, and, and, and I informed Alyssa and, and the committee that I've had conversations um, with Lynn um, and, and also with Mandy Jo uh, and one other person whose name is escaping me right now um, to basically say, uh, OCA needs to carry out the process it just adopted. And so the agreement was uh, the earliest the council might vote on a restructuring would be January 27th. It's on the agenda tonight for discussion, um, but the earliest vote would be January 27th, at which point we should know sort of the timeline of our process. Um, and the agreement that the president gave to me was that the, uh, the, the motion to do the restructuring would have an effective date that would be after the council votes on the planning board appointments. So we might we might agree that we're gonna restructure, we might, she might start polling for membership, but it wouldn't actually go into effect until after we've appointed a member of the planning board. Um, that of course assumes that this planning board appointment process goes smoothly and we end up doing that, um, but that conversation has been had. So that was what we spent most of our time with. As, as with um, with regard to the second point, um, I, I will take that criticism because that is, is mine to take. Um, my intention was to, for OCA to have a conversation about this um, before GOL moved forward. Um, and I know that because, uh, I know that uh, the chair of CRC did have this discussion with CRC, and I know uh, the chair of finance had a later discussion about it, um, about the recommendation of finance subsuming audit. Uh, the reason we did not have a conversation about it, to be perfectly honest, was that we were so consumed with the process that every meeting, um, in fact, it, if you look at, not that I would expect you to, but if you looked at our December 9th agenda, there was an original agenda and then a revised agenda, and the original agenda actually had this on it as an agenda item. And then when I recognized, uh, when we didn't get through everything we needed to do on December 2nd, I took it off the agenda because for me, I was prioritizing getting a process in place. So it actually was scheduled to be on our December 9th agenda, and then I bumped it to the 20th um, because we just didn't, that was when I still assumed we would get through the entire process on December 2nd and, had, and we were gonna do liaisons and that on December 9th. And so uh, that December 20th meeting was created just for liaisons, but also I was able to bump that. Um, of course, at that point, GOL had sort of already made its recommendation uh, to some extent. Um, so that is, I mean, I would apologize to the committee for that. It had been, it had been my intention to bring it forward to us, um, but every time I wanted to, we ended up meeting until noon about the process and it just sort of felt like uh, we needed to get that process done. So then the earliest I was able to get it before this committee was uh, December 20th. So that is on me. Thoughts about the, I don't want to spend uh, too, too much time on this because we do have a lot, but I do want to make sure Oka has sort of a response. Darcy. Um, I, I have a little bit the same response as Alyssa in that the first I heard that this was even being considered was in the GOL report of December 16th. And, um, and that was just a little, like a list in your GOL report indicating kind of an outline of an overview of what you were thinking about. So I was pretty floored when I got this document with the proposed actual charges of committees because this feels like me, to me, like something that should emanate from a council retreat or a full council discussion and then go to the GOL uh, to be created. So it's, it seems odd to me that obviously the GOL has had a few 
meetings where this has been thoroughly discussed, uh, but the rest of the council didn't know anything about it. Um, and this seems like very monumental changes, which I may very well agree with eventually, some of them anyway. I don't really have any problems with dividing up the, the responsibilities of CRC or giving audit to the Finance Committee. The, I think the hardest one is the dissolution of OCA and figuring out what to do with our responsibilities if we did that and, um, uh, and also kind of like divvying up what goes to the CRC and the other committee. Um, but even talking about it, it makes me feel uncomfortable because I, I feel like it should have emanated from a full discussion with all 13 counselors. Sarah. So I made a New Year's resolution to make sure that I communicated more openly and more constructively with the rest of my counselors, um, therefore to be more effective. Um, I will say that um, although I realized that GO GOL felt that they had very important work and you discussed it amongst yourselves and then you brought it forth once you finally made a decision. I, I will say the way in which it was handled and I, I think that we could maybe look at this for later on. Um, I'm going to make some constructive, you know, suggestions later, but I will say that when I found out the way that I did and agreed, I had a migraine that day, I wasn't here to hear it when it, it came to us. Um, and then it also made me feel like, well, I better make sure that I read every single committee's minutes and anything that I can find in their SharePoint so that I don't, so that I feel like I know what every committee is doing. And I will tell you the way it was handled. It, I did initially feel very angry um, and it made me feel more distrustful. And so maybe we can just think like in the future, you know, was this, a, you know, I don't know how it could have been handled differently, but it did feel a little strange that this was such an in-depth conversation as it went on that two of our members, like we just, and again, how do we do that and not violate open meeting law or do we, I, I don't know. But I just wanted to say that, and then with that out of the way, to say that I did have some, you know, if we, uh, tonight I think I'll bring this up, I had some ideas about maybe restructuring like where some of the appointments went just to sort of even them out. So um, that was another thing that it uh, had occurred to me that maybe appointments, all of them didn't just go to GOL, but perhaps as we're restructuring and thinking about more efficient ways to handle responsibilities that maybe some appointments fit in other committees just more naturally. Uh, okay. And so again, I will take responsibility for OCA not having had prior notice that is, that is on me. Um, you know, one, th one thing I do wanna, and, and George, if you wanna pipe in as, as chair of OCA, I mean, chair of GOL at any point, um, one, one thing I do want to say is, is GOL hasn't actually voted on this yet. So GOL isn't recommending this necessarily. It hasn't voted on this. And the idea was it's easier to have some of these, in the same way that our president, when we had our first committee discussion, brought some example committees to us. And then we sort of said, eh, we don't like this. We like this. We like this. I think GOL felt it would be useful for the council in having this discussion, which I think we all agreed should happen, to have actual examples before them, um, but GOL hasn't taken a vote yet. I think we view this this January 6th meeting as that first conversation that Darcy sort of said of, look, we've been talking about this as the committee that's charged with doing so, and here's sort of some of our ideas. What do you think? But we haven't actually voted on this, and I think the idea, and I don't want to speak for GOL, is whatever information we get from the council is going to guide our next discussion. Um, that said, I, I don't want to necessarily be in a position where I'm explaining GOL, um, and I want to hear a little, just more about uh, this committee's thoughts on what's being recommended for OCA, because we are the people who have been in this, and we know what OCA's responsibilities are. Um, do we feel as though it makes sense to keep them in one body? Do we feel as though it makes sense to put appointment? I mean, Sarah has expressed um, 
to so, some thoughts about not putting appointments fully in GOL. Um, do we feel like it makes, I guess that's, I don't want us to, I, I'm happy to hear you critique me, that's fine. Um, but I guess I, I'm more interested in hearing as the members of GOL who have been doing, uh, sorry, OCA, who have do, been doing this work for a year, um, how do we feel about what GOL is proposing? Um, because we're the ones who have the in-depth knowledge of those aspects of our charge, the outreach and the appointments, and do we feel like what they're proposing is reasonable, makes sense. That, that's, that's, that's what I'm hoping OCA can have a response to because we're the ones who have the content knowledge. Sarah. Um, so I think that early on when uh, OCA started to meet, you know, we, took, we were really exploring our charge and how we could be most effective in it. I think it became very clear to us early on that the outreach portion of our charge was not there. It, it wasn't there. We, we tried hard. We met with the RAC who let us know that they thought that our appointments process was pretty much cuckoo and way out there and they were going to follow a, a process that was more similar to what the select board had done and that that's what they were doing and they, you know, they could meet with us every now and again but they didn't, they didn't feel like uh, OCA and RAC were two entities that worked together because we did we did different things. Um, then we had the um, community participation officers and we met with them and it became very clear that a lot of things that we thought that perhaps OCA would do were actually the charge of the CPOs and that they also, you know, in many ways worked for, for the town manager and that while they helped us tremendously, um, we, we didn't necessarily need to liaise with them about how to do things. They were going to be helping town council in many ways that we had originally thought maybe would be an OCA charge, um, like helping councilors um, set up their um, district meetings or you know helping with uh, larger meetings that we had with the public or hearings. And so that didn't seem to be part of our charge. Uh, I think we looked at that pretty in depth. Um, and we did the survey in which we, you know, we wanted to gather some information for counselors and that, that was that. So I, I feel like, and then when it comes to the appointments, um, because if you're looking at restructuring and you're looking at efficiency, I would say if you do not want to have a five per, just a five person committee that works solely on one thing, which is appointments and then has a lot of time off, it makes sense to dissolve OCA. However, I do feel that appointments, even though they don't come up very often, so you could say, well, a, a committee who deals with appointments, you're just gonna be working very sporadically. Um, I think appointments, we all know, are incredibly important. And, and we know that the rest of our counselors feel like it's incredibly important. And we've seen that, that everyone really wants to have a hand in it and has an idea about how appointments go. I would rather, instead of putting all of the appointments in GOL, I would be thinking about as you're restructuring committees, we're trying to restructure them so that they're efficient um, and that nobody has like, you know, more power than another committee. We all have, I think that you're, some of the things that GOL looked at were making sure that um, every counselor had something meaty to deal with, right? And that to try to um, lessen our workload, we didn't have, one committee didn't have like uh, so many things and then another committee just wasn't meeting at all. So there was a balance of workload as well. So um, I was thinking maybe that um, as you're restructuring things, the CRC is now broken, would be broken into two parts. And one of them deals mostly with planning and zoning, right? And really needs to know in depth about planning and zoning. That's, that's what they're doing. And I think that one of the things that when we were doing appointments to the planning board and the zoning board of appeals, one of their complaints was that they did not feel like OCA knew enough about what they did as committees. And I'm just thinking that maybe you put planning and zoning appointments there because you do have a committee that's working very, very close. You know, that's their job. And so I think that that would be helpful. I would maybe say that GOL, um, because they do more um, governance could maybe be the ones that take a look at Paul's appointments and 
and handle those. Um, if you're splitting up CRC and then you have a second half of CRC that does more interface with the, the things that have to do with the public, then maybe you say, maybe mm -hmm. department heads go there because they might be, it's something, something of that nature, like seeing where they fit. And another reason why I think that maybe you want to split them up with different committees that have different areas of expertise is also, I think one of the things that OCA has struggled with is that we really tried very hard in a very sincere way to make sure that we made appointments fair and transparent and that we also really listened to our other counselors. And I think that we're still hearing that other counselors still are not feeling like they have enough control or they, they don't feel comfortable with it. I think that if you split up appointments between committees, I think that instead of having uh, counselors feel like they're sympathetic with what we're going through, right? Because sympathy means you, you don't know what the person's going through, but you feel for them. You would have more empathy between committees about how the appointments process is done and the things that you're all struggling with. And in which case, I think that we would have more empathy and perhaps more uh, just trust and understanding in the appointments process itself throughout the entire council. Okay. Alyssa? So to be clear, I'm not blaming you. I'm blaming GOL as a group because GOL could just as easily have said, oh, we haven't heard from OCA yet. They haven't had time to deal with this yet. We don't need to put this forward yet. I understand that I'm being told that even though it wasn't voted on, even though when you read the reams of information that GOL has provided, it certainly makes it seem like they think all those things are a pretty good idea. I think if it's just stated tonight for the public and for the rest of the counselors that there was no conversation here before that documentation was made, I think that's fine. I mean, you know, we're all figuring this out as we go along. And, um, you know, Darcy mentioned a retreat. I would think of just waiting and saying, you know, we can't do it yet because they haven't gotten around to their part yet. Just like when we refer things to finance committee and CRC at the same time and we say, oh, they haven't done their part on percent per art yet. Um, so we can't act on it. So I do appreciate, as I also mentioned to George, I do appreciate the details they, that were provided by GOL in terms of, well, here would be some ways to look at it. And there are, is a lot laid out there so that you can kind of look at it and go, hmm, well, maybe not that one. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And, and so I appreciate all the work that went into that. I don't deny that that's fantastic. So I'm, I'm pleased with the product, even though I wasn't pleased with the process. Um, in terms, though, I think it's important to make that disclaimer tonight when it's first brought up rather than waiting for me to whine about it <laughs> is because it's not even close to equivalent to say talking to the finance committee chair about subsuming the incredibly minor, important but minor work of the audit committee is anything like a conversation about disbanding, dissolving Gia OCA and putting their things into other people. It, it's just not an equivalent conversation. Sure, we can all get, yeah, audit sounds great. Um, they don't, nobody needs to fight about that. Um, and, I, and I get that a lot of this really is more about CRC and how to break it up effectively. And if you're gonna break CRC up effectively, then looking at how OCA might fit into that. I wanna remind us though that given given exactly what we said earlier today about how we didn't have enough time to get to this conversation, there's no way GOL is going to be able to do anything else, any of their other work, if they eat all of the appointment work, because we're still doing this process. This process isn't done yet. So even if we do the planning board interviews on the 22nd and make that appointment, we're not fully finished with figuring out our process. So one thing I would, I would hope that we would consider is maybe doing this in stages. That's something I think I could get behind. Like, you know, moving, <laughs> we'll pick on the audit thing, moving the audit piece into finance and then potentially breaking up CRC into the new, I've already forgotten the acronym, but you'll teach <laughs> it to me, um, has a T in it, and, and see how that goes and then we, then phase like over the, like a month later, like two months later, I mean like six months from now, I mean like just a little bit later. But I don't think we have to restructure 
Oka right away. I think we could go away, we could go ahead with the other parts of it because I don't disagree that in theory it makes sense, either Sarah's method or the method that's been outlined. The other thing I wanna make sure that I don't think, I'm sure that GOL must have talked about a lot, but I don't think I really got from the paperwork that we received in the packet, which is really helpful, is how many committees each of us are gonna serve on. Because it, it's, it's really confusing to me how that's gonna work just in terms of number of seats, and I'm sure that there must have been some conversation about that, so I just wonder if, if that could be shared with us, because that helps inform me mm -hmm. as to what's happening, because I feel like OCA has been treated poorly by the entire council on numerous occasions. And so now I feel like we're kind of being punished. <laughs> so I just wanna be clear that that's, I know that's not what the GOL's goal was. I know that because I know the people that are there and that's not what their goal was. But it certainly does still feel like this is just a continuation of let's kick Oka some more. So ha helping me to understand as you're trying to balance this workload who, how many people are serving on how many committees, that would help me a lot. Darcy. Yeah, I would just like to say that I, I um, would hope that the, I feel like there's a definite place for um, a, an appointments committee. And I know that when, when Lynn initially put together these committees, there was already a city services committee that she proposed and it was pulled off the table and now it's coming back. Um, and a lot of, you know, Northampton has a similar system with the same committees, including a city services and a CRC type committee and an appointments committee and so on. And obviously there is a reason for appointments um, and it is different from what everybody else is doing. And, you know, one possibility, I, I don't like to think that we're dissolving OCA because we're creating another committee and we are all beyond our capacity um, and just feel like we can't have another committee so we have to dissolve a committee in order to have this new committee. Um, so, and I also share Alyssa's feeling that, you know, there's a little bit of a <laughs> sense that the council might want to get rid of OCA for whatever reason. Um, I just feel like a as we go on, we will need to have people that are doing appointments somewhere. There, it'll probably have to be, a, if it isn't OCA, it'll have to be a subcommittee of another committee, probably. Um, and if we just uh, retained OCA and just met once a month, you know, as we, after we get all of our processes done and all we're doing is actually appointments, we could just meet once a month um, and just deal with appointments and that would be that and it would be very, it would be very simple. We get the appointment recommendations and then we just meet to do the appointments. And it seems like that is more clear cut than trying to fit it into some committee that is or is not really related to appointments. Sarah. Yeah, so it, I want to kind of gather ooh, or continue on some of that thought, which is when you're thinking about restructuring committees, like I said, I could see where you can say, well, this committee is only doing one thing and they don't meet very often once things get set. Why don't we put it somewhere else? Um, I have a couple thoughts on that. One is that it's it's true, I, I you know, <laughs> OCA does, has taken a lot of, of uh, flack for the work that we've done, and I, I really feel like a lot of the, the counselors either are frustrated by us, or I'm just, I'm gonna say it, I feel like there's not a lot of respect for the work that we've done, and, and I feel like other counselors find us frustrating, and, and part of what this seems like is saying to me, I agree with Alyssa in the fact that it seems that what's being said is this group cannot is not doing this the way we would like it to be done. We're not happy with their work. Let's put it somewhere where we feel like it's in 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 better hands. And that could just me feeling, you know, ornery and I'm old. 
But at the same time, we have worked very hard on these processes, right, in each process. We've come up with a second process that we've worked really hard to address all of the concerns of other counselors, and we only met with ire when we brought it up. It was still, I think, that the entire council needs to vote on this before OCA gets away from itself again. So, I also enjoy working with all the counselors that I, that I work with, and I, I just wanna say that as we're, if you want to fold this in somewhere else, I think, as Alyssa said, that the process should still be thought of. Uh, I would feel uncomfortable if this got handed over to someone else and all of a sudden every single process that we worked on was suddenly just thrown out. I, I will tell you that that would make me feel pretty uncomfortable. Um, and also, I think that GOL, as far as its structure is, is very powerful, and there's nothing wrong with that. We have finance committee that is also incredibly powerful. I just do not see taking something as important, you know, our president said to me, you know, OCA, with his appointments, is an incredibly powerful committee. But then what you're doing is you're taking something that's also a very powerful responsibility and then putting it into a committee, GOL, that already has an incredible amount of powerful responsibility. So that's why I'm thinking of if you're if you're not going to leave us to just do, you know, say we're on other committees and we we do just handle this here and again and that's our thing and we we keep that power in one place, then I think as we're looking at putting this appointment somewhere else that we're still evening out the powerful decisions. That's Okay, so I think what I'm, what I'm hearing with regard in response to the proposal based on OCA's experience is some concern um, from members of OCA about putting appointments in GOL um, for various reasons, one being workload, one being perhaps a lot of power, uh, one being that they're very separate and also uh, something that really need to be handled on their own. Um, and there's been a few ideas of perhaps separating out appointments and spreading them to a few different committees or having uh, OCA stay as a, as a uh, sixth standing committee of the council that just meets to do appointments perhaps once a month. Um, so it sounds, so, so that's information that, you know, I would hope to relay to the council tonight that based on OCA's experience with appointments, um, there, is, there is some disagreement with about uh, moving appointments and, and here's why. Did you have something to add? I guess I just feel like if we're gonna have a, discussion with the whole council. I mean, I know you're going to make your report of the committee that we discussed it, but if we're having a discussion of the whole council, we'll probably want to say our things ourselves. You know what I mean? Yeah, I, I, my, my whole thing is I don't, and I don't know how the president is intending to structure the, the discussion about this tonight, but if there is, um, if I am, look to for a response from OCA. I mean, certainly I would expect every member of the council will have their own opinion to give. Um, but if there's any question about, you know, what OCA's discussion about this meant, that would be my attempt to summarize it. George. I agree with Darcy that, that in the best of all possible worlds, this probably should have been the product of a retreat. Um, and that's kind of what I envisioned at one point a long time ago. But um, given all the things that we are being asked to do and demands on everyone, um, I felt this was a good way to get a conversation started. Um, it's already eaten up 40 minutes of this meeting which I think at this point the chair rightly probably would like to move on and I think we should. Um, I, I'm terrified that it's gonna use up a huge amount of time tonight. I think the point, the purpose of what we did was simply to get people to think about, the council to think about how we've been functioning through the first year. And here's a suggestion, um, and obviously it's provoked some response, which is exactly what we wanted. And where we proceed from here, I don't know. But certainly there was no intention to say, well, here's what we should do. We've decided, da, 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 da. It's just to get us all to be in thinking about um, how we could do this better. Um, and that's not an easy thing to do, um, but that's what I think we 
our purpose in creating this document was uh, and to get you to think about it and to um, then decide how you want to proceed. You might want to uh, make this the subject of a retreat. You might, well, I mean, I just hope tonight we don't spend an hour and a half talking about it, um, which is probably what we'll do. Um, not because it's a done deal, it isn't at all. It's to get people to begin to think about how we might um, better organize ourselves. And that's, so that was the purpose. Um, it's obviously provoked some response, which is fine. I don't feel like apologizing for GOL, quite frankly, and I don't intend to tonight. Um, it's simply a matter of trying to get a conversation started. And where you all decide as a uh, body to go from there is, is a decision we'll make tonight. And hopefully we'll not spend the entire night discussing all this, but we'll come to some sense of what would be the, a good way to proceed. Uh, a retreat wouldn't be a bad idea. Uh, anyway. Sarah? And the last thing I'm going to say about this, because I agree with George, Wow, you know, we are talking about dissolving a committee. Some of us are not on other committees, but took this on as our sole responsibility. And I have to say that when you originally go to a committee and say, let's talk about dissolving us, it might be all very well and good if you're sitting on a committee that has decided that this could be a good idea. But what I feel like is being said is, oh, there goes Oka again, just talking and talking and talking. And there's, there's better things to talk about than, you know, you're being dissolved, so shush now. That's how I feel. I, I feel really angry about it. Okay. So I do want us to, to get to some of the other agenda items. Could I ask Joel to address something tonight? Which would be? Which would Given that you are portraying this as a, we did a ton of work that was simply to get a conversation started mm -hmm. versus this is a proposal, which is not clear from the paperwork, mm -hmm. um, is that, and, and from the process that was used, mm -hmm. and the fact that you don't even want to talk about it anymore, <laughs> is that, which I don't know when we're going to talk about it since we've been trying to schedule a retreat for three months, <laughs> is how does this impact our committee assignments? Right, because isn't that part of why you're doing this right now is because you expected that there might be a shuffling in committee assignments because people said, oh, I don't really like doing this anymore, I'd like to try doing this other thing. But if you don't know what that other thing is, because it's gonna be a new thing, um, I just, uh, I don't know if you have a sense from the president or if you can say tonight, we're concerned about that interface too, right? Like, are we gonna all change committees and then change the committees? Or are we gonna change the committees and then all change committees? Yeah. Okay, so I want to move on to agenda item four. Um, so there is a document in your packet uh, labeled sufficiency of the pool discussion guidance. Uh, this was my attempt to bring together uh, all of the information uh, once it loads on my computer uh, that I thought would be useful for this discussion. And it's not loading on my computer, so hopefully it's loading on your computers. <laughs> um, so, per the process that we adopted on December 9th, section three um, says that before we can proceed to actually conducting interviews, uh, OCA needs to, by majority vote, declare that the applicant pool is sufficient to proceed to those interviews. Uh, so in the document that I put in the packet, sufficiency of the pool discussion guidance, I have a few different things. So one is the actual just cut and paste text from the process that we adopted so you don't have to go try and find what we're doing in the process itself. On page two, I labeled relevant information, I took um, I broke down the process, um, or, or the text of the process, um, and sort of annotated it uh, a bit. Uh, page three is an email sent by the planning board chair. Uh, page four are my notes from a meeting that I had with the planning board chair. Um, and then 
page five is some demographic information. Uh, so where I think I want to focus on is page two for the first part of this discussion. And so there are sort of five different considerations that I saw in the text that we adopted with regard to declaring the applicant pool sufficient. Uh, I think two are sort of check boxes, and I think the other three are really discussions. So the first one is that we cannot declare the pool sufficient until the vacancy notice has been published on the town bulletin board for at least 14 days. That's a charter requirement. Uh, the vacancy notice was published on the town bulletin board on October 21st, 2019. So we have more than met that requirement. Uh, the second thing was that OCA shall collect all CIFs submitted over the preceding two years. The OCA chair or designee shall contact any applicant who submitted their CIF prior to the posting of the vacancy notice to confirm continued interest. I have done that. Um, I actually reached out to everyone who submitted a CAF, not just those before the posting of the vacancy notice because uh, it did take us quite some time to get a process together and, and people may have changed their mind in, in those several months. Uh, I will say that this was uh, a challenging feat that I've learned. Um, you know, before we had town staff pull together the CAFs and contact people and do the, all the interviews. Uh, the reason we did this process is we wanted complete control over that. I will say from experience that that is challenging um, in, in part because uh, where we keep this information varies. Uh, with the change of government, we started using Civic Plus. Before that, it was an access database. They don't necessarily track well. Um, so this involved lots of long phone conversations um, with Angela to get the full list but I did contact every person who submitted a CAF from, for the planning board um, from October 21st, 2017 until anyone who submitted after that. Um, that included, uh, I'll also note, um, people who submitted and have been appointed to other committees. So, uh, you know, per, per the appointed committee handbook, uh, generally we say no more than two standing committees um, per person for service, um, but also we recognize that some people might want to leave a committee if they have a different opportunity. And so um, I did not, the only people I filtered out of contacting were people who we confirmed did not live in Amherst. Um, there were some people who lived in Springfield and Belchertown, um, and those I did not contact um, because they're ineligible, but other than that, I did not filter anyone out. Uh, as far as the other, so those are the two check boxes. And those two things have been done. As far as the other three things, um, we said that we aren't having any type of thresholds. We look at the pool holistically, but there are three things that we're looking at. One is the number of applicants relative to the numbers of vacancies or impending vacancies. OCA strives for more applicants than vacancies. We currently have one vacancy. We do have more applicants than vacancies. We said the demographic diversity of the applicant pool, OCA strives for a diverse applicant pool, including racial, economic, gender, and generational diversity. There is gen, uh, demographic information of the confirmed pool on the fifth page. I think we can all agree this is an area where the pool is lacking. Um, and then the third thing is the current needs of the body to be appointed, including any current burdens placed on the body as a, by a vacancy. Um, you can see in the email from the planning board chair also, um, I reported from conversations uh, had with uh, uh, planning director Chris Brestrup uh, that there is a feeling amongst the planning board and planning department that there is a burden placed on the planning board by this vacancy. Um, the ZBA, of course, we know we, we've heard there is not so much of a burden because they have associates to pull from. The planning board does not have associates to pull from. Uh, so right now they have only six members. Because special permits and site plan review require five votes, that uh, the planning board chair and the planning director have reported have been a burden for the committee. Because what that means is uh, that if, there, if someone can't be at a meeting or if there's a conflict of interest, um, then that presents a big challenge for the planning board uh, because they need to be able to make sure they can get to those five votes. Uh, we saw that play out in the fall uh, when Amherst College had a project in front of them and two of the planning board members were abutters, um, which meant that literally that project could not be approved unless the town council approved a waiver 
uh, which we ended up, which the council did do. Um, but if the council opted not to approve that waiver for those two abutters, uh, there were only four people who could vote on that project, and they need five votes. And so we've heard from the planning department and from the planning board that this vacancy has actually been a fairly significant burden, um, and there is a desire to see someone appointed quickly. Um, so when we're looking at the pool holistically, these are the three things that we want to look at is um, the number of applicants, we know we have more than there are vacancies, the demographics and um, the current burdens placed. And so we know we have more applicants than uh, vacancies. I think we will probably agree that the demographics are lacking a bit, um, but we do know also that there is a burden. Before we move on to actually looking at who is in the pool, are there comments on this? Do we wanna have a discussion on this stuff? Uh, what, what's in this document, and especially those last three points? Alyssa. Going to pipe up that although uh, you laid out a lot of terrific information here and maybe didn't even put enough emphasis on something you actually provided to us, which was your, the um, email that we've gotten from the planning board chair and the conversation that you had with the planning board chair. I appreciate you attaching those to both the sufficiency of the pool discussion and the other item on selection guidance because just like you know the things we put in our process about what's important, right? The demographic diversity, you explained that all really well. And the logistical nature of you actually need enough bodies to do it right. is that sufficiency of the pool is also related directly to, just as it says in that sentence, the ne current needs of the body to be appointed. And so I think that's so important and I really appreciate that you were able to work in not only that email but that she'd sent us previously but also a separate conversation because that does tell us a ton. Like, to be fair, we're, we're, we don't have diversity uh, and we're not gonna have diversity in the short run because we have a lot of work to do on that. And we haven't traditionally had diversity on the planning board. And so I'm not dismissing that because it frustrates the heck out of me. But I wanna make sure that given that we can't get that right now, we're at least meeting the needs of not just bodies, but the kinds of bodies that they need. I think that's so important. It would be a really, it would have been a bad idea to try and say sufficiency of the pool without knowing what they were actually looking for right, right now, in addition to all of our generally held concepts about diversity. Other thoughts on what's in this document? And I think this, this highlights, you know, a discussion that we had when we were coming up with this section um, about about thresholds, I think you know. For me, and I'm speaking personally, um, I I am fine with the number of people in the pool. Um, I, but I am very uncomfortable with the demographics of the pool um, because if you look at the information, um, it is a hundred percent white or Caucasian. I've been told I can't recategorize people, so I am presenting them as separate categories. It is 100% white or Caucasian men over the age of 50. Um, and this is to fill a vacancy um, that was held by, a, by this community standards young woman of color. Right? And so um, to, 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 to fill that seat um, from a pool that is 100% uh, white and Caucasian men over the age of 50 uh, feels personally uncomfortable to me. And I think this is not the pool that I would have liked to see. Um, and I know I certainly did, you know, in my personal capacity, <laughs> reaching out to people to say, you know, do you know anyone who can apply? Especially, do you know any women who would be interested? I, I think that, um, I, and I know others did their own personal outreach to try to get people to apply, um, and so I am personally uncomfortable with the demographics of the pool, but I also am recognizing it in the context of, we have heard from the planning board um, since honestly before the resignation that they are facing a challenge um, and, and really need another body. And so I think this, this is a good example of what we were anticipating when we came up with 
this process of saying we're not going to have rigid thresholds. We have to look at the pool holistically. Um, Darcy. I don't have anything to say about that, but I would like to mention something about the previous two pages. The, um, the Chris, uh, Christine Gray Mullen's letter and your meeting with her. Um, it seems like your meeting with her went over basically, you know, what the planning board needs um, with, with our interview questions sort of in mind. Um, mm -hmm. And her letter, on the other hand, she listed four things the planning board was looking for that are really different from the list that you got from your meeting with her. And so one of the things that seems pretty amazing about her letter is that she says she's looking for an individual that's willing to put in a time commitment of five to 12 hours a week. That's a lot. <laughs> um, that is a huge amount. So I don't know what we're going to do with that if we have people who are willing to put in two hours a week. I mean, I don't know if we're gonna, I don't think we're, we'll ask that question, but that seems pretty, pretty a big heavy load. And she also says, she also expresses um, a philosophical bent in number two, that she wants someone who feels positive and committed to strengthening and growing Amherst economic development and building housing infrastructure, particularly in the downtown and village areas. So that's exactly what we said we weren't going to ask as an interview question. So, um, so I'm not sure what we're gonna do with that. Yeah, so, so I'm gonna just pause that conversation because I think that comes in two places. So one is the next conversation that I hope we can get through today, which is selection guidance, um, which we said we'd provide. And then the other thing is the interview questions. Um, and I think you're right, th those things is, you know, this is the email from the chair of the planning board, um, but ultimately uh, the council is the appointing body and, and we're the committee that that, that sort of handles this. And so it'll be on us to say, do we want to put that in selection guidance? Do we want to incorporate that into an interview question or not? Um, okay, so any other comments on sort of this document? Okay, so I'm going to hand out another document, um, but I want to preface it um, with some information. Uh, so this is the results of my outreach to people who submitted uh, community activity forms from October 21st, 2017 until present and shows you who is still interested, who has withdrawn, and who never got back to me. <laughs> um, and I did, for, for most of these people, I did try to contact them multiple times. Um, Recognizing, of course, this is not the easiest time of year to get in touch with people, um, but it's sort of the, the hand we were dealt. Um, and so there are two different tables. One shows the results of my contact, and then the other shows uh, a breakout of the people who are still interested. Uh, I want, before I hand this out, I want to remind this committee that CAS are personnel records, still by our policy. They are not public documents. This has information from those CAFs, and so by extension should also be treated as a personnel record. This document is a confidential document. It is not public record. Um, also remember that we do not disclose names or numbers prior to the posting of interviews, which has not been done. And so we are going to have a conversation about whether you feel comfortable with the pool so that we can decide whether we're gonna declare the pool sufficient. But at no point during this conversation um, are we to say the number of people or the names of any individuals? Are there questions on that? Okay. And I will be collecting this at the end of the meeting, yes. Can I ask that So take a couple minutes just to, to read through the document and then just give me some signal when everyone is ready to have the discussion.
Can I just get an update from people of, about, are we about ready to move on? Or are we still considering this document? Darcy? Yeah, I'm wondering what was the process around getting a response? I'm sorry, what do you mean? In other words, was did you send one email or what, uh, how does that work? I, I sent an email. Uh, the email actually, the text of the email is in the packet so you can see what the email actually looked like. Um, and then for folks who I did not hear back from um, within about a week, uh, I sent a follow-up email. And most, to be honest, most of the responses I got to were to the follow-up email, um, probably because the first email was sent, I think, on December 18th, so most people are probably getting ready for the holidays. Um, okay, so the question before us is whether or not to declare the applicant pool sufficient to proceed to interviews. So as I said before, we have three considerations. One is the number of people. We know we have more applicants than we have vacancies. Two is the demographics, uh, where we strive to have a, 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 demo, a demographically diverse pool. And three are the current needs of the body. We know that the body is struggling um, with this vacancy. Uh, the other thing that Alyssa brought up is it's not just about numbers, but making sure that there are people who could bring, I think, skills to the body, which is why knowing who's in the pool in this document is important. Um, so, again, this conversation needs to happen without disclosing names or numbers, but I am asking for the committee's input on, based on the information you have in front of you, whether or not you feel as though the pool is sufficient to move forward to interviews, why or why not. The floor is open. Thoughts on this, Darcy? I, um, I guess my only thought would be, to, you know, if we wanted more diversity, that we could make a phone call to the women, because <laughs> <laughs> um, there are some women who, with no response. Um, I, I don't, I don't feel strongly about that. Yeah, I will say, you know, it, the order of the names are in order of when, you may have noticed this, when they submitted their CAF. Okay. Um, and so unfortunately, um, we did have one woman who was a recent CAF who withdrew. Um, and many of the others uh, had replied that also withdrew because they had been appointed to other committees. Um, and so, yeah, we could do that. What, one thing I do want to also just stress, if I was going to mention this before, is remember that we did, um, it, we, dis we discussed this when we were discussing the process, and we also discussed this in our last meeting, say, um, once we schedule interviews, if we get additional applicants and they can meet the interview dates, then, you know, the, declaring the pool sufficient today doesn't cut the pool off. And so, for instance, if we declare the pool sufficient and then we hear from another person who hasn't yet responded, you know, we can keep... I can keep contacting these people, um, or if we get more applicants, as long as they're available on the interview date once we set it. Um, so declaring the pool sufficient just allows us to proceed to interview. It doesn't close the pool. Um, so, Other thoughts? Sarah. Sorry, Evan, I, this is just, did you say you also called? You said there was a lot of phone calls, so you did also. I did not call these people. Um, the phone calls I, I referenced were <laughs> with Angela trying to just get the pool. I'm just going to say a suggestion that you can take or leave or throw out or whatever is that um, because this was something that I had for a, a task the original time around, right. there were some people that I, I um, can say that uh, I may or may not recognize from this <laughs> list that I found that I was only able to contact by phone. Okay. And I don't know if that matters or not. I mean, I'm just saying that maybe we should think about, like, um, I think you did a great job. I'm just saying maybe we should institute something saying we send one email and then a follow-up or there aren't phone calls or there are. Just, I think, for as far as process goes, yeah. I think that's a, a good thing to hit. And, and, and I'll say you know, to the committee, if you would like me to, regardless of what we decide in this meeting today, if you would like me to call the non-respondents, I would, I would be more than happy 
too. And I think my thought had been if we still hadn't heard from people in a while, I would call. Honestly, I ran out of time um, because also the past two weeks have been very busy. Um, but yeah, no, I, I, I agree. George. Just concerned about the demands on the chair. Um, this is something that I think in, in the rest of the world would be done by staff. Um, that's my concern about having him or her make multiple phone calls, emails, knock on doors. Um, it, it's at some point this becomes, I understand the motivation. We want to try and reach everybody and make sure everybody has a chance to respond, but I'm also concerned about um, the burden on the chair. And uh, I don't understand why this could not be something uh, done by staff. Um, but apparently that's, well, anyway, that's my concern. I think the, the body, what we have in front of us is sufficient to proceed. Um, obviously, we prefer a larger number, we prefer more diversity, but given the needs of the committee and given what we see in front of us, I'm certainly willing to say that I'm, I would like to proceed with this pool that is sufficient. Sarah. Um, so I agree with George. This is a really big responsibility to give someone, and we were elected officials, but we're, you know. <laughs> Here's the thing that I will say is that these are still volunteer positions, and I think myself that I found out a lot more about how deeply people felt about these positions, and maybe if there might have been people who sort of were waffling a little bit, and I myself found the phone calls um, helpful. So maybe something we, we might want to do, which I think this that Oka thought about before, was this is a huge responsibility for one person, so perhaps maybe the chair does delegate some of these things to, and again, yeah. in a different committee, maybe somebody else, you know, you delegate someone to do some of the the extra calling so that it's not such a burden to just the chair. Okay. Alyssa. Um, I'm sorry that it was so complicated to get the paperwork. It's always been complicated to get the paperwork. I don't know why three town managers ago we didn't provide adequate resources to staff to better manage the paperwork. It's that blunt. It, it's mm -hmm. always been a nightmare for staff to deal with the paperwork, um, no matter which format we were using. and. So that has always been frustrating. Um, so appreciate that they worked with you on this. In terms of making the phone calls, I think it actually, again, delegation is always a beautiful thing, but of course then different people might feel like they're getting treated differently. But as much as I, on the one hand, believe that if you can't respond to an email, which is how you submitted your application, then you know, you're just not interested anymore, except I don't believe there was a deadline specified in the email. There was not. And so that makes it a little harder for me to cut people off. Mm -hmm. But the, and then in terms of the actual phone call making, I don't think it's appropriate for staff to make the phone call because I didn't think it was appropriate for staff to be doing that the first time, mm -hmm. which is that this is our appointment. This is an appointment by somebody from the town, from people from the town council. And so while I think that they ought to be able to just crank out a spreadsheet for you like that, and if they can't, that's a town <laughs> manager problem. That should not be our problem or their problem, it's a town manager problem. Um, that then people need to feel like the people who are appointing them are the ones who are talking to them and talking to them about the fact that they might already be on a different committee and did they want to change. I don't think that's a clerical task. I think that's a, you know, welcoming people into the, oh, you're serving on such and such, oh great, how's that going? You know, yeah. it becomes this whole outreach and community thing. But I also get that it's a huge amount of work for one person. So I could imagine, given where we're at, given that they didn't get a deadline, that we could go, a, if we agree, based on what we have, that we have a sufficient pool based on all the different criteria we've talked about, that we could then send out an e meaning you, until you delegate it to somebody else, an email that says, this is when it's gonna be. Yep. You need to tell me by such and such date mm -hmm. if you're gonna okay. be there, and um, then I can send you a bunch of stuff, or I can send you the stuff and then you can change your mind, but we, the people can always do that. But I know that one of the things, for example, that we'll be sending them is the handout that we created that's now on the planning board webpage because it was so awesome that we worked on. But 
if that needs to be beefed up in terms of the time commitment, for example, or anything like that, then that gets then that can be sent out to people. But I think that if we do the sufficient pool, we can still, just like you said, if people can make it, we can still send out a thing that says, okay, we decided we're going forward with this date. You need to tell me by 12 noon on such and such date if you're okay. going to be there or not. Okay. And then maybe call them if you don't hear back. Yeah. All right, this is all actually really good input because you know this is the first time we're, we're doing this. And you know I, I, I had a lot of thoughts about I, you know, I didn't make phone calls for a few different reasons, uh, one of which is I'm a millennial and we don't do that very often. Um, but the, the, other, the other of which was also, I remember, um, especially as we dealt with some issues with um, the non-voting resident members of the Finance Committee, um, there was some concern about, oh, well, I had a phone call and this is what I thought they said. And, then the, and, um, and so I kind of liked the idea of having the actual text so if, if you heard back from someone and they said, no, I was interested. You know, I, there's, it's not just a, well, they told me on the phone, or this is how I interpreted that. Um, and so I did kind of want to have it in text, but I think that Sarah's point is also well taken that sometimes some people it's just easier to get on, um, on phone. And, yeah. Bringing that up. <laughs> now that I think about it, uh, my generation probably taught yours about avoiding phones because I avoid them at all costs. But now that I think about it, people actually who are over my coming age of 50, some of them do actually prefer to talk on the phone. I'm just yeah. going to put it that way just as a NFYI, just a tidbit of information, no pushing. Okay. Um, okay. So there was something else I was going to say, but I already forgot it. So, uh -huh. So the question again before us is based on all of the information we have is, is the pool sufficient to proceed to interviews? Yes. Okay, so we need to, I'm, I'm seeing a majority of the committee nod, so we need to do it by majority vote. So does someone want to make a motion to declare that the applicant pool for the planning board is sufficient to proceed to interviews. I so move. George has moved. Is there a second? Is there a second? I will second. Okay, so the motion has been made and seconded to declare that the applicant pool for the planning board is sufficient to proceed to interviews. Is there any additional discussion? Okay, all those in favor, please raise your hand and say aye. Aye. Aye, so that is unanimous. Okay, so the second thing before us, or the, the second, the fifth agenda item, um, is development and vote on planning board selection guidance. Um, so in your packet, there is another document which has most, much of the same information as, as, as Alyssa pointed out, uh, labeled selection guidance discussion guidance. Um, and so what we said is prior to developing interview questions or holding interviews, OCA shall, by majority vote, adopt selection guidance for filling the vacancy that OCA, uh, that OCA provides to the town council in advance of interviews. Um, and so this is our way of sort of developing, um, it, we didn't want to, we used the word criteria before and decided we didn't want to use criteria, um, but guidance, guidance for how we might select someone, um, what we're going in looking for um, that we would provide to the town council to help them uh, in their in their deliberations, there were two areas that we looked at. One was criteria for a healthy multiple member body, which you might remember we had some discussion on, um, and the other was input from the body's chair. So again, to attach to to this document are two things. One is an email from the planning board chair uh, regarding what she felt uh, would be useful, um, and then the other are my notes from the meeting with the planning board chair. Um, which, as, as Darcy said, we're a little more focused around what exactly uh, they think would be useful. So what we're looking to do here is come up 
is go is I would say probably go through these and say, is this something that we feel as OCA we want to include in a document that helps um, us and by extension the council uh, evaluate candidates during interviews. So I will. Alyssa. Do we have, I meant to do this over the weekend. Do, you, do we have at your fingertips the questions we asked planning board candidates last time? Because I to me, that, yeah. that, that, you know, it's like, where, do, where does the concept fit? Is it within the question or is it within the selection criteria or is it kind of, it's kind of both, hopefully. I think that is a good point and I can pull that up. I, I can try and find, I thought it was in a folder that it's apparently not in, so um, does, I will. Does anybody remember the date of the that's what meeting, I'm the, the infamous meeting? Do you remember it, Sarah? The date that we brought the initial, that that would have been in the packet? It was traumatic and I yeah. blocked it from my <laughs> mind, but I'm sure that I could find it. <laughs> Peter is unfortunately struggling today. By all means. So it's not that. It was in the report too, right? You, you're looking at that, okay. They should be in the report. Are you in the report now? Okay, and they're there? Yay. Okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sarah to come back. Uh, I'll take, well, since this is a well, I'll take these documents back. <laughs> Can we grab that? Yeah, I have the, so it's the interview questions. Yep. Yep. That's what I have too. Yes. <laughs> Correct. Are you 
in the report to town council? Um, 520. 520. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Is it in here? Oh. It's on, so, oh, you know what it is? So this is, no, you're, this is, uh, <laughs> our pages are numbered, so this is page 21 of the document, oh, but right. page 16 of the report. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 And that's a page number on page 16. Yes. So the previous page was 16. Right. It's the, because this, to technically, this report was an addendum to a much shorter report that would have had different page numbers. Um, so it's page 21 of the document. So, um, again, so what's the, the, the subject before us right now um, is selection guidance. And so we have the interview questions here, you have in that document that I provided for you, um, input in two forms, one via email and one being a meeting from the planning board chair about what she feels the needs of the body are. And now we need to put together a draft document of what we feel um, the council should consider and look at when it's evaluating the candidates in the interview. And I think Alyssa's question is well taken, which is some of this might be better represented in selection guidance, where some of it might be better represented in the interview questions. Um, the interview questions, that will be the topic, that's on our agenda today, that will be the topic of our Wednesday meeting. Um, and so, I think what we wanna do is look at, is perhaps the best way to do this, are because our interview questions from last time were very vague, um, is, perhaps look at the input we got from the planning board chair and think about how we want to utilize that. So what we heard, um, let, me, let me talk about actually my meeting with the planning board chair. Um, and this occurred on October 18th, so this was shortly after um, the, the planning board vacancy appeared, um, and the conversation that I had with the planning board chair, which you have uh, all of the notes I took, which I'm realizing now were somewhat sparse, um, is a desire to see uh, someone come onto the planning board that has some pre-existing professional expertise. Um, and the reason for that was, numerous reasons for that were numerous. One was that our planning board, in the opinion of the planning board chair, is a very young planning board in that most of the people who would be considered the senior members of the planning board have not actually been there that long. Um, and so as we've heard time and time again, there's a big learning curve for the planning board. And so there's a desire to have someone who doesn't necessarily need a whole lot of training, who can sort of just jump right in because uh, this is a planning board that, that doesn't have sort of that long-term institutional knowledge or experience. Uh, the, the second reason um, is because this is a regulatory body that deals with fairly technical subject matter and there was a desire to have someone that has some professional expertise related to that subject matter and in particular she pulled out four areas of expertise real estate, development, planning or urban planning, and zoning. Those were the areas that she felt like were really missing with regard to expertise. Um, and then the third thing that she discussed, which is sort of represented in here, is the idea that um, there are certain perspectives and certain areas of expertise that are important to have on the planning board, some of which are already there and so don't necessarily need to be duplicated. And so for example, it is useful to have a lawyer on the planning board because they make a lot of legal decisions. Uh, the planning board currently has two lawyers. And so there ne isn't necessarily, you know, her, her thing was legal expertise is important. We have two, two of the six current people are lawyers. We don't necessarily need another lawyer. We have um, uh, a 
uh, hydrologist, which is important because they deal with a lot of stormwater stuff. And so her failing was the hydrology was sort of covered. There's someone who has um, no real professional background in the planning board who sort of serves the role as uh, a lay person or who brings the perspective of the, the public. Um, and so the feeling was that there wasn't necessarily a, another need for that. Um, but there is a need for especially these four areas because there isn't anyone, uh, and there's an architect on the planning board. Um, there isn't some, and there's an engineer on the planning board. And so architect, engineer, uh, lawyer, hydrology, sort of public perspective, all of those are well represented on the planning board right now. Um, but someone with real estate experience, development experience, actual planning experience, or experience with zoning, that is not currently represented. And so her feeling was that those would be really the areas we'd want to look for um, to bring into the fold. So that was my meeting with the planning board chair, um, which hopefully is a little bit more useful than the sparse notes that I have um, here. So, and that's sort of also represented here. So the question is, how do we want to use this information um, to fulfill uh, section 4B of our process, which asks, asks us um, to get input from the body's chair and incorporate that into selection guidance? Sorry. I would just, I would just write, I mean, I, I think that the last time I did it, I wrote down, I think all of us wrote down what the chair said and then used that for guidance. So, I mean, right. we would simply say, um, the chair is looking for someone with real estate development, and I'm sorry, I don't remember the last. Uh, planning or zoning. Um, she feels that they need someone who already has, uh, they, they don't need another lay person, and they specifically would like someone who has um, knowledge of how boards and committees work. Yep. So someone who's already served on boards and committees. So I, I would simply write down what she has communicated um, and use them as part of our guidance. I believe that's what we did before. Yeah. So I think we're, if we are taking into consideration what the chair would like, I think we already have something very specific. Okay. Yeah, we've never officially made selection guidance. That's what we did last time. And so I think the question is, do we want to do that where we literally just reproduce what the chair said, or do we want to pick and choose? And, and it sounds like you're saying, let's just reproduce it, but make sure it's clear this is the chair. Yeah. I would just say because I, I think that one of the things that we're continually hearing from other counselors is that um, they care very deeply about what a chair thinks. So we can use this as for our selection guidance to say, you know, here's what the chair wants. Here's what we found, and then we recommend, and then the rest of the council makes their decision. Okay. Darcy. I think this should be part of our guidance. Mm -hmm. It shouldn't be our selection criteria. You know, it's just something that we, yeah. it's, it's a consideration for us to look at. Okay. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So, so I guess, and again, we've never officially made selection guidance before. We're, we're sort of figuring out what this even means to us. And so perhaps the selection guidance would have a couple different sections. And one would just say, here's what the chair wants. And so clearly labeled, this is not Oka's opinion. This is not what Oka is saying needs to happen. This is what the chair says. But then there would be other sections. Yeah. yeah I think in some respects, that's what we did is one of the things we looked at is like, OK, let's look at this body holistically, right? right? And so what makes a healthy body? Then we look at what the chair wants. And then I feel like you just sort of put things down through the, the filter. Okay. You know, I don't think that we've always chosen what the chair wanted. And maybe we rethink right. where that got all of us. And just, yeah. So you're yeah. looking at what makes a, a body healthy. And then you're looking at what the chair has asked for. And I'm not sure if there's anything else that we want to take into consideration. I'd be open to listening to that. Other thoughts? Darcy? Um, I, I, if we're just talking about this, you know, I express my opinion. I think this should be taken into consideration. I guess I, uh, it, nowhere have we really talked about, you know, having a diversity of voices on the planning board and that's not the chair's concern. Um, so those are just two separate things. Okay. Alyssa. So 
I guess I'm seeing three sections at this point. The, cri okay. the criteria for a healthy multiple member body, which we have agreed on in the past. Um, and then just looking at the top line, you know, A was criteria. B was input from the body's chair, so then that's clearly specified that that's the, from the chair. Mm -hmm. And C is um, beyond the healthy body, which is generically true, right? We look at, we look at through that lens at all committee appointments, mm -hmm. then specifically for planning board. Mm -hmm. And so um, just as, so it's like we're, we're already filtering down, right? Because we've got the healthy member body that's for everybody, then we've got what the planning board chair thinks, and now we've got what we think about the planning board given what we've been hearing. Okay. And so diversity of opinion might be one. Not having um, a specific viewpoint on a particular existing project, like that we're specifically okay. trying to accommodate a specific viewpoint or not. I mean, that might be the place that we address those kinds okay. of concerns when we said very clearly here, we're not gonna ask that question but you know, as that comes out over the course of the interview, for example, or is known to people, for people's political views because they've written lunch to the editor or whatever, um, how that, how we view that, because I think we should be upfront about what we mean by diversity of opinion. Do we mean that you know, there there are people who would argue that developers all think the same way, and I would put you in a room with two developers and tell you they think completely different ways right, right. about how to do things. So I think that that's a, a, a silly assumption on people's part, but that tends to be a political rallying cry. Developers are bad, they all think the same way. <laughs> um, and so I think we should elaborate a little bit on that, maybe not knock ourselves out, but it, it's a way of reflecting the current political reality that okay. we're all facing. Okay, so what I think I'm, I'm hearing is a three-part selection guidance. One would sort of just be literally reproduction, maybe contextualized slightly, of A, criteria for a healthy multiple member body, which to be honest, I think for this discussion um, is not necessarily as relevant um, because we're only dealing with one vacancy. There are, none of the people are a potential reappointment to the planning board. Um, and so, to some extent, I think A is a little bit moot here. Um, B, which would be input from the body's chair, where we're literally just going to be reproducing what the chair, clearly labeled uh, reproducing what the chair told us. And then C will sort of be OCA's other considerations, other things we might want to, to think about uh, that I think we want to make sure that we have at least a majority agreement, agreement on here. Um, so so with that, then, it seems like A and B are sort of already written. Um, and so the question is, what, what is C? What is not covered in the input from the planning board chair and from sort of the generic A that we want to include as, as we're looking at candidates and as the council is looking at candidates, here's some other things we want people thinking about, which I think is, is really, we're not, it, we need to make sure we're not using the word criteria because none of this is criteria, right? We're not, we, we, we uh, proactively decided not to use the word criteria when we discussed this section. It's guidance. It's here's what we want you thinking about. Here's some things that we want you to consider um, as you're looking at these people. So what do we want those things to be? Darcy. Just to repeat what I said previously, I, I think that we need to have a diversity of voices on the planning board, and we have to uh, look at that to s make sure that the, you know, the different voices in town are represented there, so that it's not a monolith of one point of view um, putting forward an agenda where we know, we know for a fact that, you know, a whole lot of the town feels like they want their voice represented on the planning board too. So how do we do that? Yeah, I guess where I'm, I'm curious on how to actual, I'd, I'd be curious to hear you talk about how to actualize that, right? Because I'm thinking in terms of, there are six current members of the planning board who all have their own views and opinions that I think they would all say are independent views and, and opinions. 
And so when I hear, hear diversity of voices, I think about diversity. We want people from different income levels, different generations, different racial perspectives, which we know we don't have. We know we literally do not have in this pool. So when you're looking at different candidates who are individual people, how do you assess, how do you consider diversity? Like, what do you, what do you mean by that? Well, I think that there, that there, you know, there's been controversy in the past year or so over certain decisions that the planning board has made. And um, uh, I think that that, and during all of our campaigns, we talked to people about how they felt about uh, downtown development and so on. Um, and, um, you know, it's pretty clear to me that, that ha you know, at least half the town um, was unhappy with, you know, the downtown buildings and, um, and certain aspects of them. So, I wouldn't want a situation where we just, you know, have every single member of the planning board um, or, you know, close to, or a large majority of the planning board um, lined up to support something that, you know, a proportional number, amount of the town doesn't. So. Um, I think, you know, in other towns, and I've said this before in the town council meetings, you know, there are, there are Republicans and Democrats. <laughs> and we set aside a certain number of seats on the planning board for the Democrats and a certain a number of seats for the Republicans. And, and, um, and that gets work, the diversity of voices is, is baked in. Here, we don't have that, so we have to figure out a way to make sure that we get that diversity on the planning board, which is a very, you know, it's a very important um, committee. So, you know, you've heard this from me before. I've tried to argue it in different ways. <laughs> um, so I just, uh, I don't know, it, the, 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 the point that, that the planning board chair made that she wants um, the person to feel positive and committed to strengthening and growing Amherst economic development and building housing infrastructure, particularly in the downtown village areas. That might be a question that we would ask to see what people answered. You know, they might say, "Yes, I, you know, I, I fought against that, or I was all for that, or whatever," um, so that we would get an idea of, um, you know, whether that person was going to add, make the, make the planning board more proportional in voices. Sarah. So, I understand what Dr. said. I, I want to be really clear that even when I think that Oka tried very hard to make decisions that, you know, we wanted open-minded people. Um, you know, we didn't want anybody who was set one way or the other. Um, when we made our recommendations, we were still hammered by other counselors and by the public and by bloggers and by the planning board and the zoning board appeals themselves who consistently said the decisions that we were making, the people that we were recommending were based on politics. And I'm gonna say this again with consistency for like the 25 millionth <laughs> time. When there are decisions made for the town that are so large, I do not think that anyone who is on town council who cares about Amherst holistically as a town should be looking at what I don't want someone serving, making these decisions that is so hell-bent on a perspective that they cannot listen to, see, or consider other options. That does not bring us to a middle ground. That does not ever allow us to openly and with a pure heart and an open mind like think about things that 
are different from what maybe our, our initial knee-jerk reaction to something is. I don't, when I said the, the things that the people that I recommended, they was, it was not political, I meant it. And I don't wanna see this political. I would rather have, find ways to ask questions or, or you know, see how when in, a, in a, everybody sitting together, how they work with each other. I want to see people who don't have their mind completely made up. I don't want to see people that are angry, which is something, you know what, I struggle with myself. I, I will admit that. I would like to see people who are excited about Amherst and its future and that don't are not entrenched. I want to see people who like to work with each other and listen to each other. So I, I don't, I don't, I would rather avoid this somehow, honestly and truly. Yeah, I, w I would say, so there's two points I want to make and why I'm uncomfortable with having this as a, as a part of selection guidance. So I think the first thing to note is, um, Darcy, you particularly referenced some of the, the building, the larger building projects in town, but. I, I'm not sure if I, no one who's currently on the planning board was on the planning board, I believe, when those projects were approved. And so it's the Spring Street? Well, Spring Street doesn't exist yet. Um, so I, I think that to say, to say, well, the planning board approved these projects and we don't like them, and so we need people who were against them, ignores the fact that most of the planning board wasn't there for a lot of the the buildings have been a, a focus. But I think the other thing is to say that the planning board is a regulatory body largely that interprets the zoning bylaw and uh, applies it. And so I think we acknowledge that it has become a very politicized body in this town. Um, but I think to say that we're going to lean into the politicization of the planning board by making sure that we have people who are opposed to previous planning board decisions actually does a disservice to the body and only further makes it more polarizing and more political as opposed to respecting what it really should be, which is a body that just applies the zone and bylaw of town. So if we're talking about diversity of voices as saying it'd be great to have people who experience the town in different ways, people who experience the town as low income people, people who experience the town as a young family trying to buy a house or a renter who's looking to rent some of these new units, that I would support, but if we're saying uh, diversity of voices as we want, we want people who have differing um, political agendas, I, I don't think I would support that as a piece of uh, uh, selection guidance. Darcy. Um, I guess I would just say that, um, that I feel responsible to represent my constituents um, and their, what they want, so that, you know, it became pretty clear to me that at least half the town uh, wants a voice on the planning committee, so on the planning board. So um, I guess I would be, I personally would really want to make sure that the voices became equalized to represent my own constituents. Sarah? And, you know, I, I don't want to also be so naive as to say that we don't know that the planning board itself, um, I, don't, I don't know how to say this without, I hear what Darcy's saying. I want to make sure that we are across the board being fair and this is again me being naive in all of our hearts when we, we, we look at these people because I don't think that we want to say, I, I don't want to say that I, I think that, you know, well, everybody that, I think we also need to be honest with ourselves about what's being represented, right? So like Evan said, you, you want to look for diversity of, you know, let's keep looking for a diversity of different viewpoints. And then I think we'll probably be getting to what Darcy's saying as far as the diversity of voices. George. We have two of uh, what I look to be three uh, elements for selection criteria, and I'd like us to just come to some resolution. Um, my thought would be that the third element would be essentially simply a description of, of the nature of this kind of particular body. So a planning board, just a, a statement of what uh, traditionally planning boards look like or what are the kinds of things that are traditionally uh, required for service on a planning board. These are very specialized bodies. They're not just, right, so um, if we do come up with a third, 
maybe we could just have the two. But right now what we have is input from the chair, seems appropriate, um, our healthy, criteria for healthy body, we've agreed upon, I think we're okay there, and we're just struggling with this third thing. And it seems to me whatever, if there's going to be a third element, it should be fairly uh, straightforward and descriptive. Um, I would turn to uh, the planning department or to, right, and just have them, uh, you know, again, getting some input from uh, people who do this for a living and um, in terms of what these kinds of bodies traditionally look like. Um, pretty descriptive, uh, and that would be it. Um, trying to get into uh, diversity of this or that and political stuff is, is, is just, it'll come out of the wash, and there's no way we can use it anyway. So um, uh, if we're going to have a third element, what do you, what do you all want? Um, I seems to me what would be useful to me would be a uh, description provided by uh, the planning department, uh, you know, as to what these kinds of bodies traditionally look like. Um, in other words, factual information, description um, that we could use in evaluating candidates. Um, if that's controversial, then maybe we should just go with one or two. Alyssa. George, I think you're missing the handout we wrote. <laughs> that's exactly what that is. Good, and we've got it. We've okay. already got that piece. Fine. Yeah. And we wrote that, and then we asked the planning director to, yeah. to have input on that. Yeah. Um, I, I do want to just comment, since it's out there in the air now, and obviously press will do what the press will do. I totally disagree that half the community is against the building. That, that's not a factual statement. That's your interpretation of what you heard during the campaign. That's not what I heard during the campaign. That's not what I believe to be true. I also believe that people look at things a lot differently when they look at the revenue that's coming in and the fact that we didn't have to make massive cuts to our budgets because we had revenue coming in from projects that some people like looking at, some people don't like looking at, and most people actually don't care at all when it comes right down to it, if we're going to make statements like that. Um, I, think, I think including the handout, like, that, that, that covers what George said is, is really important because it's not just important for the applicants, but it's important for the town council to remind ourselves, <laughs> just like we put it in our report um, when we had our you know 40-page report or whatever we gave them back in May. Um, I think the other thing that we need to continue to educate our constituents about is that what you want, what some people have wanted, is they wanted a previous planning board to interpret the, the current bylaw a different way. The previous planning board did not choose to do that. They felt they had plenty of legal grounds not to do it that way. The answer isn't to change the planning board members. The answer is to change the zoning bylaw. The zoning bylaws often come out of planning board meetings, right, because they see what they deal with and they're like, oh wow, this isn't working out the way we thought. Let's change the zoning bylaw. And that's why they would bring things to town meeting, to change them. We, of course, as a town council now have this ability, now that we meet more often, to say, to say our constituents are telling us this part of the zoning bylaw doesn't work right. And then we give a revised zoning bylaw to any planning board to get them to interpret. It is true that there is a level of interpretation and it is true that that has been politically frustrating for people throughout history. But the reality is still that the place that you represent is in engaging people to serve on committees who have the skills that you need for a particular committee and then giving them bylaws that are good bylaws, that you think are good bylaws, that your constituents think are good bylaws to work within. It isn't their job to push as hard as they can to work around the bylaws because they have a particular political viewpoint. It's their job to deal with the bylaws they have or make the bylaws better. So that's what I consider my responsibility, my constituents, is make the bylaws better so that whoever's interpreting them, you're not giving them the wiggle room that you're afraid you don't want them to have. So, so one thing I want to point out is in section six that we adopted, we said in advance of interviews, the OCA chair shall distribute to the town council and all interviewees the adopted selection guidance, interview questions, and committee handouts. And so the committee handout that Alyssa referenced is something that will be given to the applicants and the town council um, as part of sort of this interview packet. So I guess then the question before us is whether we want, we already agreed on these first two sections of selection guidance. The question is, do we want a third section that's sort of other things we want the council to consider that aren't part of the other two? Um, Darcy has thrown out one idea um, that she would include in that. Uh, going into this conversation, my thought was, 
it would be, uh, the planning board chair gave us a lot of sort of specific professional things. My thing would be um, more, I was thinking in terms of more character traits, so people who don't have a lot of rigid positions on something. I don't think it's, I, I think it's bad if someone comes in with a very hard, rigid position on something. Um, I was thinking on things like, I remember when I was talking uh, to Councillor Schreiber about his service on the planning board, and I said, what made the planning board successful? What's the one thing? And he said, you know, the ability to collaborate with people and to compromise with people. Um, and so my thought was, those were the things I would include in this section, not being rigidly wed to something, uh, being able to play well with others. Having this discussion now, I feel like perhaps it, it's something you can't, it's hard to evaluate that as selection guidance, and perhaps that's something that's better worked into a question, which we already have right now, a question about something about, tell us about how you've collaborated with others. And so um, having heard what George just said, now I'm, I'm questioning whether we have this third section or if the character traits that I'm looking for don't make sense as a, we want people who play well together as opposed, and maybe just working it into the question. So what are people's thoughts on that? Am I, am I, I don't know if I said that coherently. Yeah. So I think it was Mark Parent actually, who I, I think I brought this up when we first were doing this, gave me, I, I thought, an excellent criteria of things to look for. I don't know if that's what that should be. I'm I think sure that is in that. And, and I, I personally loved that because he did cover a lot of things about, you know, being professional, but, and, you know, what the, the, you know, you need different professions, yada, yada, you need to know what you're doing and with codes and this and that, but he also really brought up some very good points about um, how someone can effectively serve, right, with other people. So I don't know if there's a way that we could just, uh, just like we say, well, the chair is asking for these things, we could maybe give some of those things as like our general, uh, we have some things, so I think we should incorporate them in some way, as in, it could just be like traits um, that a successful, you know, just, and, and some of the things, and you may think that, well, in an interview, I'm not gonna see it. I will tell you from the interviews that I did, you don't have to search for that information. <laughs> no, seriously, in no, three minutes, right. people will tell you in many different ways how they do want those things as well as how they feel about things. You don't have to search for it. You'll see it. I don't think there's any harm in putting that in there. Um, but mostly, I think the third document, so we might want to just say, like, even you could put it in with a healthy multi-member body, these are things that make, um, you know, a certain person work well in a committee. Um, and then the third document, which I think would just be the description of what the planning board, the zoning board, whatever does, because those are the facts. And I, you know, you try to stay as, as close to facts that other people, you know, can't dispute as you, you can. George? I agree with Sarah that, that this does seem important. So I guess Evan's question is, do we need a third element? And I'm, I'm feeling that a third element to this would be helpful. Okay. Um, not to create more work for you, and it would be along Please. the lines of what Sarah might be suggesting in terms of uh, uh, something that maybe uh, Mark Parent had also uh, spelled out. But it, I think it's true that when we're looking at the candidates, that this is an element that I think most of us are thinking about. Um, not just what the input from the chair has been, not just our broad criteria of, of a, for a healthy body, but you know, can this person uh, work with a body, uh, do they seem collaborative, uh, capable of compromise, is there evidence for this in their record and also in terms of how they, uh, the interview goes. So um, this could be a third element. Okay. Um, it's Alyssa. I agree and I'm not sure if, if it gets it needs to be in there because we want it to be something for selection guidance. Mm -hmm. But I think it also, and I won't be here for your questions conversation, and so the thing I'm gonna throw out now is what that you have on Wednesday, is that I wonder if there's a way, given that we could tweak these questions to be more specific to planning board and the things that we've been hearing, right, because there should be some relationship between the selection guidance and the interview questions, mm -hmm. is, how there is already a question about collaboration. Yep. But I think that one of the really big philosophical differences 
that we should try and get at that I think actually touches on the political nature but in a different way is how do we ask a question beyond the collaboration thing's good, right? Like they can talk about how they've worked on large committees or small committees right. or whatever kinds of committees, and that's always cool. But a, another question, and, and I leave it to you to think about, is how to get across to people my, what I believe to be successful uh, committee work, which is that you're not getting appointed to come in and say, I represent the people of the town who don't like the downtown buildings. So you lose every vote, so good for you. What have you brought to the process? Right. Nothing. You've brought that people don't like it, but we don't have a majority, and we're not gonna change the zoning bylaw, and we're not gonna change whether or not somebody gets a permit, but we got some press. That's useless. I think that's useless at town council, I think it's useless at historical commission, I think it's useless at planning board. If you can't come in with an, we all have our political biases, of course, but if you can't come in and say, my job is to interpret the zoning bylaw in a way that makes sense based on what we've done so far, and the strength, you know, whether, I don't know that we wanna say any of the stuff about strengthening downtown, but what I'm trying to get across is, I don't need planning board members, I don't wanna appoint planning board members who think they're this, just there to appoint to represent a point of view in town without collaborating to get votes to either deny permits or to change the zoning bylaw. Being on the end of a vote is a useless form of service and just frustrates the rest of the committee. You should not be in lockstep, absolutely not. You shouldn't all be a rubber stamp but you have to be on different things. You have to be willing to talk about, well, I sort of get what you're saying on this, but no, I can't go any further on that. But if your only goal is to say, I hate downtown buildings, I, I wanna weed those people out. Yeah. And I would like to be able to weed that out with a question rather than guessing based on their Google results. Darcy. So Alyssa, are you saying that you um, would want, if there are diverse voices in that way, that you would want that person to be able to work on amending the bylaw in the way that he or she wants it, or, yeah, no, absolutely, you don't want someone who's just, no, 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 you want right. someone right. who is going to be working and trying to convince the other members to do whatever it is, you know? Um, to amend the bylaw or, or work with him or her to do whatever they're putting forward. So I agree totally with that. But, and that's the reason that we need the diverse voices. Sarah. This is what I'm gonna say, because I, I, I think we've talked a lot about all of this. I would say that yes, I think we want to maybe add some of the things. I, I loved a lot of the lists that Mark Parent gave us. I think that we should add that in somewhere. I don't know that it necessarily has to be the third thing. I think we could simplify it and perhaps put it under what makes a healthy multi-member body. These are characteristics in a certain individual see, yeah. that makes yeah. them a creative, uh, a working member, right, of a multi-member body. I think that what Alyssa's getting at, which I think there is so much wisdom in, is that an effective member of a body is able to bring their perspective, even if it is completely different than 12 other people's, bring it to other people in a way that makes them willing to think and talk about it yeah. and then come somewhere come to a middle ground, come, you have to be able to persuade people, not just piss them off. Yeah. So I, I think that, I don't think we, we, I don't think there's any other way than just saying, talking about collaboration, that you can really get to that with a person. I am thinking that if you ask that collaboration question, then most likely people who have that point of view will tell you, I worked on such and such a committee, we had a problem right. with blah, 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 I helped facilitate something. I, I don't know if, I don't know if an actual ask question is going to get to that. That's, and I think the only third criteria, like I said, would just be the, the description of what that, that body does. Okay, so what I'm hearing is that 
it sounds like people feel it would be useful to have either another section of selection guidance or perhaps worked into the section on criteria for healthy member body, enhancing that with some traits of members of that body that make it healthy and that make it productive, um, and incorporating that potentially into the selection guidance. We've all thrown out a couple ideas of what that would be. Um, here's what I'm gonna recommend we do. We already have a meeting scheduled for Wednesday. Mm -hmm. That meeting was supposed to be just about interview questions, but I think what we're also finding from this conversation is that in some ways these two are very closely related because the selection guidance is going to inform our interview questions. So I am going to close this conversation now and reopen it at the, op at the beginning of our Wednesday meeting and what I'm gonna add, I will try and find that list from Mark Parent and add it to the packet um, along with our, uh, our current questions. And what I'm gonna ask the members who will be there Wednesday to do is to think about, based on what you see in that list, based on your thoughts, um, take some time to think about that and bring to the meeting the sort of characteristics or traits of a member of the body that you think would be useful to include what we'll do is we'll open the conversation on Wednesday's meeting with what are those traits, hopefully come to some consensus around what are those traits and characteristics, work them into the selection guidance, and then that will be a jumping off point for, for I think we'll probably use the questions we have as sort of the, the foundation for our questions about interview questions, but then based on the selection guidance that we all just agreed to and the traits that we know we're looking for, how maybe can we modify the questions to better elicit responses that show us those? Um, I think if we sit here now and we try and think of what those traits are, it, we're gonna take a long time and it's better if we each go home and think about that, you know, giving you a little bit of homework um, and come with them on Wednesday. Darcy. Could I just add that I would love it if we could all think about how we could include diversity of voices within those traits in a way that would be acceptable to the members of this committee. Okay. Um, okay, so I'm gonna close that agenda item and we will continue that at our Wednesday meeting. Uh, so three things uh, before we head out today. Uh, so regarding agenda item six, our discussion of our January 6th report to council. Um, I hope you had an opportunity to read uh, the OCA report on liaisons. That will be uh, discussed tonight at the council. So uh, mostly what we're gonna be talking about is the conversation that this committee had on 1220 that recommended nine town bodies that, should, that, that OCA is recommending have a liaison. Um, I will also be providing the council with a very brief update about where we are in the process um, for the planning board. Our next meeting is this Wednesday at 9.30 in the morning. It is not in this room because I believe CRC is meeting in this room at that time. Um, it will be in the IT conference room or the lower level conference room. Um, I got lost trying to find it the first time. So if you don't know where it is, give yourself a, a little bit or maybe go down there now and find it. It's sort of a weird little room. It feels like the situation room. Um, it does, right? It does. Um, <laughs> um, so that's where we'll be. Right now the meeting is scheduled 9.30 to 10.30. I'm hoping we can do it in an hour, although if we have to finish up selection guidance, that, that might be ambitious. Um, but I'm hoping it won't take up too much time. Um, so that's the second thing I wanna say. Third thing is, I, is now that we have declared the applicant pool sufficient, we can move on to scheduling interviews. Um, the date I threw out to all of you was January 22nd. Every person who confirmed they are still interested I asked if they were available on January, the evening of January 22nd, and they all confirmed that they were. So I'm going to, because some of them confirmed that, you know, on December 18th, I'm going to reconfirm that date with them. But given that every member of this committee reported they were available that evening, and given every member, uh, every applicant who confirmed their continued interest confirmed that they were available that evening, um, unless I hear otherwise from one of the applicants, um, I will likely move to schedule the planning board interviews for that evening. Um, I think there's then some logistical conversations that we need to have to make sure we have everything ready. But in theory, if we have selection guidance and interview questions done at our Wednesday meeting, we should have the interview packet ready to go to the council and to the applicants. Um, are there thoughts, comments, questions on that? George. Just really quickly. Um, 
to conduct the interviews in these special meetings, all we need is a quorum, correct? Correct. We do need a quorum, although I was hoping that every member no, of this committee would Absolutely. be No, I understand. Absolutely. I'm just saying, you know, if someone can't make it or the car breaks down or they get sick, or blah, 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 um, that wouldn't sink the, uh, the meeting right. as long as we have a quorum. As long as we have a quorum. Thank you. And again, this meeting would, the only agenda item would be the interviews. There will be no votes taken at that meeting. Alyssa. What time? I would have to, I, all I, I, the, the feelers I put out were the evening of January 22nd. I'm just, I'm just getting a sense of, could we quick get a sense from the five of us what time we can do? Because depending on, because we're not talking about numbers, depending on how many people we have to rotate through, it could take a couple of hours. So um, are we available at six? Are we available at seven? And what time are we available? Um, if we're on the calendar. Yeah. Okay. I've cleared my calendar for that, so. I could be available by six. The only thing is I just found out that my other half will be gone on okay. that date. So I might just want to talk to you or Angela. Just, I mean, they're old kids. Was just somewhere to stash my old kids in case they <laughs> need to be close stash to me. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that room there, yeah. Although it gets very cold. It sounds like, a, I think, Six is good. So again, I will run that by, you know, I'm, I'm sure to prioritizing the availability of the, the applicants right now. Um, Absolutely, but I, I'd shoot but, for six okay. so that we're not I will, here I will throw out to them six and, and then yeah. six works okay. if they'll all be back in town from their jobs, et cetera. Okay. Okay. Um, and I will give you an update when I have more information on that. Uh, public comment? Okay. So with that, I am going to adjourn us at 11.39 a.m.